Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's lecture where we start our discussion on the book Fertile Matters. The key arguments and goals of this book are to uh, discuss the social discourse on Mexican women's reproduction as a national threat and its impact on Mexican women's experiences, to shift the discourse away from disproving stereotypes around Mexican women's fertility, to demonstrate the historical trajectory of social discourse from breeders to zero population growth to contemporary anti-immigrant discourse, to document the impact through one particular case study, the Madrigal versus Culligan case, and also demonstrate resistance and activism by Chicana women. So she begins in the first chapter by providing numerous examples of books and commentary that argue that Mexican fertility is excessive and as such poses multiple threats to the United States. Uh, the response to, the, to this discourse has been to study the supposed high rates of fertility and searching for answers by conducting family studies. She points out the problem of studies that focus on trying to understand the unusually high rates of births among Mexican women and focusing on things like family practices and beliefs about family because such projects conceptualize, conceptualize the reproduction of Mexican origin women as a culturally dictated behavior to be understood. So first of all, these social scientists uh, defined that Mexican women's fertility was excessive and then proceeded to look into their own culture for answers as to why they supposedly have such high fertility rates. Um, and so again, it was a way to uh, end up defining Mexican culture as deviant in some kind of way. She uses the idea of racial formation theory to talk about the social construction of women of Mexican origin as hyper-fertile as a racial project, project, and that the discourse surrounding and constructing their reproductive behavior as problematic must be viewed as racially biased. Thus, this discourse around Mexican women's fertility racializes them as other. So again, a way of um, talking about Mexican women's uh, high fertility was a way to talk about them as racially different. Nativists use this rhetoric to argue against Mexican immigration. They use images of Mexicans as quote unquote breeders and as an invading force with their hyperfertility. Americanizationists use similar rhetoric for targeting Mexican mothers for Americanization. Um, since these women supposedly have so many children, the mother was a way to get to Americanize not just her, but her children as well. Americanists attempted to inculcate Anglo ideals of family planning and family size into the women's values in hopes of ultimately changing their behavior as well. Efforts to transform reproductive ideas and behavior of recent immigrants were fueled by nativist and Americanist fears of race suicide. In other words, that the white population was going to start being overrun um, and disappear in relation to the Mexican uh, population. One of the cases that the uh, reading mentions is sterilization in Puerto Rico. Um, sterilization, um, and in particular, the idea of overpopulation uh, was used to describe the economic situation in Puerto Rico starting in the 1930s. And the argument was that um, the, pro the economic problem was that there were too many people. And so the government started looking for solutions to this supposed overpopulation. One of the solutions was to look at how to control the number of births on the island. This uh, uh, project began with the experimentation of a birth, birth control methods in Puerto Rico, in particular birth control pills. Women were offered pills, but were not given adequate information about the potential dangers of the pills, which at the time were still experimental. The pills that were given to these women were two times stronger than the ones that were eventually approved for use by American women in the United States. This project then became replaced with the sterilization project where women were urged to get sterilized as a solution to their economic problems without being informed adequately about the procedure and its consequences. Women were sterilized uh, without consent while undergoing C-sections and husbands would often be the ones who signed the forms approving the procedure. Women did not understand that procedure cannot be easily reversed nor of the dangers of the reversal procedure. 
uh, these women were targeted by middle-class social workers. So there was also sort of this class dynamic going on in, uh, uh, in the situation where it was middle-class educated women that were going into the poor neighborhoods to talk to these poor uh, women um, and tell them what was best, um, what they thought was best for them and uh, their supposed poverty and their uh, large families. This project resulted in a third of the women in Puerto Rico being sterilized by the mid-1970s. Now the reading talks about how this idea of overpopulation was one that was being discussed globally um, at this time. Uh, government funding and university funding focused uh, prior to the 1960s on studies of overpopulation throughout the so-called uh, third world and their potential implications for economic and government instability in those countries. In the 1960s, the concern turned towards the US and how overpopulation in the United States would potentially impact our natural resources. In particular, many population control activists stressed that increased population growth would have disastrous consequences on both the nation's natural resources and the operation of the federal gov government ultimately decreasing the quality of life for American citizens. So one component of this uh, 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 advocacy around overpopulation were uh, environmentalists who uh, at the time believed that uh, overpopulation was a threat to the environment. Government intervention appears in 1970 with the passage of the Family Planning Services Research Act, which provided federal funding for family planning and research and created the Office of Population Affairs within the Department of Health, Education and Welfare. Congress created the Commission on Population Growth and the American Future, which was, take, which, um, which was tasked to complete a two-year assessment of the relationship between changing demographics in the US and the quality of life, and to come up with policies on the issue. The commission's recommendations included liberalization of nationwide abortion laws and government funding of voluntary abortions. President Nixon, however, didn't think abortion was an acceptable form of population control and rejected their recommendations. So I think it's really interesting to look at it, particularly given the recent overturning of Roe v. Wade, that once upon a time, policymakers in the United States actually saw um, having abortion laws and not only having those laws, but funding uh, uh, abortions by the government as a positive thing. One of the books that came out during this time that really fed this um, kind of hysteria over uh, overpopulation was the book by Pearl, Paul Ehrlich, uh, called the population bomb, which called for tax laws that would discourage reproduction, mandatory birth control education in public schools, and if necessary, compulsory birth control. Media headlines added to the panic over overpopulation, depicting uh, the overpopulation problem as leading to an increase in crime and it being unsafe for people to be out and about at night. The organization Zero Population Growth was created, um, which consisted of a coalition between environmentalists plant and Planned Parenthood to promote the decline in population. Now, this, this course of overpopulation made its way into medical schools and into the ideologies that many doctors began to have at the time. They saw themselves as responsible for doing something about overpopulation. So this gives us sort of a context to understand um, what happens in the Los Angeles uh, Medical Center where uh, women were sterilized that brought up the uh, Madrigal versus Culligan case. Uh, reports on overpopulation also began to include concerns over immigration, particularly of quote unquote illegals from Mexico and how immigration was contributing to the supposed overpopulation of the United States. This discourse on immigration would become the more popular and well-received part of the overpopulation conversation that remain with us to this day. One of the other things that we see um, in this uh, discourse and in the media representation is the idea of illegal aliens being declared a health problem 
adding to the panic over immigration. And also the 1970s uh, economic recession in the United States increased anxieties over Mexican immigrants and call for immigration uh, control. Now, what we start seeing, however, is that there's evidence uh, that begins to demonstrate that the national birth rates were declining. So in some respects, all of this um, hoopla about overpopulation um, <clears throat> and the need to control the number of births actually had results. And so we started seeing uh, the uh, birth rates in the United States declining, but this did not uh, appease um, the uh, uh, folks who were organizing um, and pushing the government on policies around overpopulation because uh, <clears throat> the what was happening was a shift between the number of white births and the number of births of children of color. Um, so that the birth rates of people of color remain higher than white birth rates, even though the overall number of birth rates in the country were coming down. So the concerns shift to whether a non-white US could continue to be a leading powerful nation. The larger non-white population, along with the civil rights movement that was happening at the time, posed a threat to the nation. So people were concerned also that if the population of people of color was larger, that there would be then, that meant there would be more, even more people um, clamoring for some civil rights and um, what that would mean in, in terms of the kinds of uh, relationships between different racial groups that people were used to at that time. Feminists begin to distance themselves from zero population proponents who weren't advocating for women's reproductive rights. So as we saw before, Planned Parenthood was part of sort of the coalition um, because it, one of the things that um, the uh, zero population group was uh, proposing at the time were things like access to abortions and birth control and so on, which were clearly things that feminists were interested in at the time. But once they saw that the discourse was sort of taking this anti-immigrant um, racist churn, they started to distance themselves from those folks. So the concern went from um, there's too many people, it's going to impact our natural resources and um, our quality of life to the genetic quality of the population in the United States. So the author of the book also talks about the factors that were contributing to the rise of sterilization abuse during this time period, which included the technological advancements in tubal ligation procedures, the availability of federal funding to cover the cost of sterilization, um, me medical regulations that were less restrictive, and funding that was made available through the office uh, focusing on the war on poverty. So uh, uh, sterilization procedures were actually attached to um, <clears throat> the uh, part of the government or the agency within the government that was addressing uh, poverty issues. So poverty became attached to um, issues of um, controlling uh, births and um, promoting sterilization. The uh, reading also talks about how the criminal justice system used sterilization as conditions for parole and probations. Uh, medical institutions started targeting poor women of color for sterilizations. And doctors tried to talk white middle-class women out of sterilization surgery. So what you see sort of this um, uh, uh, unbalance, right? Inequality between which women were being told you have too many children and you need to do, so do something about that versus which women were being um, uh, 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 advocated to, to have more children, right? Um, and so again, that goes back to this concern over the uh, racial quality of the US population. We want white women to continue to have children. We don't want poor women of color to have any more children. So the reading talks about the particular uh, case, uh, uh, the, the Madrigal versus Quilligan case, where the medical resident uh, Bernard Rosenthal came forward with evidence about so the numerous cases of for forced or coerced sterilization taking place at the hospital where many of the women were approached during childbirth after they'd been given pain medication and offered sterilization as a good, as a good option. The women signed the consent forms without understanding what they were signing. 
Among the conditions women experienced at the hospital included several co coercive tactics to get them to sign the consent form, like approaching during labor while under heavy medication or in exchange for pain medication. The forms that were used were only in English and no translations were provided, so they didn't uh, know what they were signing. Spouses were often told that their wife's life was in danger if they didn't consent to sterilization procedures. So often if the woman wasn't given uh, uh, consent, the husbands were the ones who were approached to provide the consent. Or sometimes these husbands were lied to about there being a state cesarean policy that requires sterilizations after a certain number of children. The author also describes the culture in the hospital where bilingual counselors wouldn't allow women to be discharged until they promised some form of birth control and where the number of tubal ligations done in a week were a source of pride and success. The more women were convinced to be sterilized, the more uh, medical students or interns would have the opportunity to get surgical time to practice. So again, the focus wasn't on what was in the best health interests of these women. One of the just justifications used for promoting sterilization to poor women of color was that they were a burden on public assistance. However, while the Mexican women in the Madrigal case were low income, none were on public assistance, which of course then begs the question, why were they targeted if not because of race? Or just the assumption that if they're Mexican and poor, <clears throat> they must be on public assistance. As I mentioned, women were not well informed about the tubal ligation procedure, procedure. They believed that getting their tubes tied meant they could reverse the procedure later on and be able to have children if they chose to do so. The author discusses the particularities of the Madrigal and Quilligan case versus Quilligan case and how the judge consistently demonstrated his own biases, complaining that the legal proceedings were taking too long and dismissing the testimony that demonstrated that the women had been coerced. The judge reduced the conflict to one about cultural difference. On the one side, we have a culture concerned about overpopulation. On the other is a culture that highly values a woman's ability to procreate a family. One of the plaintiff's strategies was to bring an anthropological expert to testify to the emotional and psychological impact of these sterilizations on these women. The judge dismissed it as, quote, we all know Mexicans love their children. And therefore he saw the testimony as unnecessary. The judge ends up filing in favor of the defendants, meaning in favor of the hospital and the doctors, arguing that the doctors were acting in good faith and with a bona fide belief that they were performing the sterilization operation with the knowledge and voluntary consent of each patient. The judge attributed the sterilization of the women to a communication breakdown between the women and their doctors rather than to any improper conduct. The final chapter that we had to read for this week gives us a broader context of um, how studies um, had looked at Mexican women and their fertility that helps us understand how the judge and the doctors and the other staff members in the hospital could uh, think it was okay to treat these women in this particular way, um, could uh, assume, right, that um, it was okay to target these women for uh, sterilizations and that these women should uh, uh, control the number of births that they were having, that these women were having way too many children, right? So that those ideas, right, don't come out of nowhere. There's a long history of Mexican women and their fertility being perceived in a particular kind of way um, that socialized, right, the uh, judges, the policymakers, the doctors, and so on, uh, to uh, have certain beliefs about these women that then manifested themselves and how they were they were treating these women and the kinds of policies they felt that was okay to impose onto these women. So beginning with the 1930 study, which concluded that Mexican women had a lot of children in order to avoid toiling in the fields, um, was how the author begins this particular chapter, um, where the women were perceived as uh, producing children to substitute them in the field work. Um, the term competitive breeding was uh, uh, developed during this time period through these studies to describe these women's behavior. In other words, Mexican women competed with each other to produce large number of children to to produce a large numbers of children to avoid any heavy work in the field. So these studies assumed that the reason why these women were having a lot of children 
right? And the study sort of focused just on women who did field work was to um, replace themselves. So they didn't want to do work in the field. So they were having a lot of children. So the children could go to the work in the field instead of them. This was sort of the, the conclusion that the people doing these studies came up with. The author also describes how some of these studies described women and their family values as consistent with a quote unquote pre-modern society. Some of the assumption was that once assimilated, these women would join the mo more modern society of the US and their fertility rates would adjust. Measuring fertility, fertility rates became a way of measuring successful assimilation. Subsequent studies then talked about Mexican culture as being in conflict with American culture, so that their culture was deemed as deficient in comparison to the norm of white Americans. In the 1960s, as Mexican Americans began to make civil rights demands, the concern over their increased birth rate became tied to concerns over political unrest by a large ethnic minority population. So over time, from the 1930s into the 1960s, all these studies are taking place and um, they don't change, right? As, even though there are all these different studies being made, they come up with all these different terminologies. They come up with all these different explanations um, for supposed hyperfertility among Mexicans. Um, <clears throat> the overall right uh, 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 language is that there's something wrong with these people. They're deficient, they're backward, um, uh, they're inferior to American culture. And so what we have to do is assimilate them um, and then in the 1960s, it became, well, we better hurry up and assimilate them or figure out a way to get their birth rates to decline because now this population is becoming consciously aware, right, and starting to make demands of uh, 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 citizenship demands, civil rights demands of the government. Um, and so now they're a threat in a different kind of way. So this ends the lecture for this week on this first part of the book, Fertile Matters, that really gives us a glimpse on not just the historical um, context, right, of how Mexican women's fertility has been um, over time discussed in the United States, but how all of that discourse, all of that language culminates in sterilization abuse as we see taking place in the Los Angeles um, County uh, Medical Center. So this is our lecture for this week. I look forward to seeing your comments on the discussion posts. Have a good week.